Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome. I'd, uh, many of you have taken your seats. For the rest of you who could uh, find a seat, we will start the program here. Uh, we are glad that you're here for this uh, very, very special event, uh, especially since it's had, uh, uh, it's a, has a wonderful history, the uh, Simon Lecture Series. It is a uh, fabulous part. My name is Doug DeVos. I'm a uh, president at Amway Corporation, but also honored to be a trustee on the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. And uh, it's a thrill to be able to be part of this event and to have you all here to join us. The, uh, the, uh, when the lecture series was established, Bill Simon quoted, uh, his quote would say, these lectures can make a significant contributing contribution to the public debate on how to preserve and strengthen the institutions of our free society. I don't know about you, but so many times we take the institutions of our society for granted. And we just accept that they may be there forever and ever, but it takes work to make sure that these institutions not only stay, but are strengthened and enhanced for generations to come. Last year, we were able to welcome the Japanese ambassador to the United States. We were honored to have him participate and be with us. This year, we're thrilled to have the Honorable Justice Stevens join us for the uh, presentation. We are grateful for uh, so many of you being here. Many of you are table sponsors. We want to thank you for that, but we want to especially thank those who have stepped up as in, uh, sponsored in a leadership position, and that is uh, Amway Corporation, the Cooley School of Law, Krinic Lecture, and Mercantile Bank. And in fact, I'd like to ask uh, uh, to some to stand. I'd like to ask Don DeLuke if you could stand from the Cooley Law School. Don, we recognize and thank you. From Mercantile Bank, we have a Chairman Mike Price and the President Bob Kaminsky as well. We ask you both, Sam, Bob as well. Thank you. There are a couple other special guests that are here that I would like to ask, uh, stand and recognize. Uh, President Ford's brother, Dick Ford, who we all would just say is Uncle Dick. Uncle Dick right here up front. Sam, I welcome you. And we also have uh, Justice Stevens' daughter, Sue Mullen, is here with us. And I'd like to thank you, recognize you, and welcome you to Grand Rapids as well. This is a wonderful event. This is a room that is full. We'd like to uh, also thank the Grand Rapids Rotary Club, who made this their weekly meeting. So all of our Rotarians who are joining us, welcome to you. We're glad that you're here. I would like it noted that I've attended the Rotary meeting, though, so I can get my, uh, my attendance uh, checked off. I, I can't remember my number anymore, but at least I'll have that, that part happen. Uh, I know many of you have started, but what we would like to do is uh, begin formally the uh, event this afternoon. And so we have asked the Gerald R. Ford Boy Scouts Council of America to present the colors. We'd ask you then uh, to remain standing while uh, Grand Rapids Police Officer Wally Tett sings the national anthem, which will be accompanied by bagpiper Jerry Dibble. So if I could ask you to stand, and the Boy Scout troop will present the colors. What so proudly we hail 
at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous flight o'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, send us that star-spread. Could ask you to uh, remain standing and ask our wonderful mayor, George Hartwell, to offer the invocation. George. Let us pray. Just and merciful God, from ancient times your people have called on your name when they labored under oppression, when law was used to enslave, when freedom was stifled by tyranny. While we read of opening seas and bread from heaven, we know that most often you chose wise people to administer justice, judges to stand between oppressed and oppressor and enforce your standard of fairness. In these days, you call men and women still to fulfill this ancient duty of judging right from wrong. We pray your blessing of wisdom on those who judge in our local, state, and federal courts. May the light of knowledge and the confidence of your holy presence guide each of them and all of us to do what is fair and equitable and just. Amen. Please be seated and enjoy your lunch. Susan is the mother of two daughters, Tyne and Heather, and two grandchildren, and three stepsons. She was raised in Alexandria, Virginia, as many of us know, and during her high school years, Susan lived in the White House, served as official White House hostess following her mother's surgery for breast cancer in 1974. And in 1984, Susan and her mother helped launch National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And as many of us know, Susan has been deeply involved with the Betty Ford Center since its founding in 1982 and worked side by side with her mother on so many projects there. Since 1981, Susan has served as trustee of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation 
and currently serves as co-chair of the Foundation's Programs Committee. And her work with the Foundation is centered on its core mission, our core mission, of promoting the ideals and integrity and candor that were the hallmark of the life and presidency of Gerald Ford. Susan's newest role in that capacity happens to be ship sponsor of CVN 78, the soon-to-be USS Gerald R. Ford, which will be the first of a new Ford class of Navy aircraft carriers now under construction in Newport News, Virginia. And finally, I think I speak for all of Susan's fellow trustees, Grand Rapids colleagues on the Foundation Board when I say how much we appreciate how frequently she joins us here for important occasions such as the one today. Please join me in welcoming Susan Ford Bales. Next time, there's not going to be an introducee or a introducee. I'm just going to sit and watch. So, Thank you, Hank. Thank you, Justice Stevens, Mayor Hartwell, Wally Tett, Rich and Helen DeVos, Ralph Howenstein, fellow Foundation trustees and officers, Joe Calvaruso, distinguished state and federal judges, Uncle Dick, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the William E. Simon Lecture. Dad was so proud of this lecture and series and its distinguished namesake, Secretary Bill Simon. Today we add a special chapter to Bill's lecture series. However, before I introduce our special guest, and with your indulgence, Mr. Justice, please permit me for the first to share some personal feelings during this, my first visit back to Grand Rapids after mother's passing. My heartfelt gratitude goes to the people of Michigan, particularly to the citizens of Grand Rapids and East Grand Rapids. The honors and the tributes you conducted for mom in July were and are beyond words. Thousands of you paid your respects to her casket and then line the streets along the motorcade. Please know how much the outpouring of love sustained the Ford family during those very difficult days. But I also want to extend my special thanks to Governor Rick Snyder, Major General Gregory Vanet, and the men and women of the Michigan National Guard. And we are particularly grateful to the United States Secret Service the state and local law enforcement for their kindnesses in keeping all of us and the public safe for, for their solemn vigil at mom's casket during the public repose. Thank you to my foundation trustees and staff, but particularly to Joe Calvaruso for his tireless assistance and friendship for the foundation's wonderful newsletter, Tribute to Mom. She would have been so proud and honored by that newsletter but also special thanks to Joe Tomaselli and her colleagues here at the Amway Grand Plaza, and happy birthday. And thank you to the staff of the Presidential Museum and Library, particularly to Mark Jonick and Jim Kraditz for these years of assistance in helping us to plan and conduct mom's funeral services and farewells. Since her funeral, Many people have asked me about the services and the outpouring of tributes to my mom. And I have a very simple answer from a journalist. At the end of those seven days of farewells, the journalist concluded, quote, Mrs. Ford's funeral services were exquisitely planned, flawlessly conducted in a splendid series of tributes to an extraordinary woman and first lady, the likes of whom we will never see again. The farewells in every aspect, perfect, simply perfect, and I completely agree. The farewells to mom were indeed perfect, and the people of Western Michigan are a shining example of why that was so. So to each of you who are here today and to the Western Michigan community, for your kindness to mom and the Ford family, 
and for all the love that you showed and continue to show to mom. I am forever grateful. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And since the announcement of this year's selection for the Simon Lecture, I've recalled many times Dad's pride in his appointment of Justice Stevens to the Supreme Court. And I've thought a lot about how to best express how proud Dad was of Justice Stevens' decades of distinguished service on the court. As so often was the case with Dad, I found the answer in his own words. In 2005, Dad wrote a personal letter to the dean of the Fordham University Law School. And in that letter, Dad spoke about his feelings about Justice Stevens. And he described his boundless pride in Justice Stevens' service and the special place the justice holds in Dad's magnificent historical legacy. And Dad wrote, quote, historians study the significant diplomatic, legislative, and economic events that occurred during a presidential term in order to evaluate that presidency and its legacy. Usually, that evaluation is done with little or no consideration of a president's Supreme Court appointees. Let that not be the case with my presidency. I am prepared to allow history's judgment of my team in office to rest, if necessary, exclusively on my appointment 30 years ago of John Paul Stevens to the United States Supreme Court. Justice Stevens, thank you for your extraordinary service on the Supreme Court. Thank you for your devotion to our Constitution, to the rule of law, and most of all, sir, thank you for the pride that you brought every day to my dad and to the 38th President of the United States. So it is my high honor and personal joy on behalf of dad and the Presidential Foundation to welcome and introduce the 2011 William E. Simon Lecture, ladies and gentlemen, Justice John Paul Stevens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Friends and admirers of Gerald and Betty Ford, football is a dangerous game. When I was in grammar school, I was a pretty good defensive lineman because I had been taught to hit them low, to go for the running back's ankles or knees. I did not have the opportunity to play football when I attended high school because the son of the school's athletic director had suffered a fatal injury in a game a few years earlier, and soccer, rather than football, was the sport that we played during the fall. Football was too dangerous for my classmates and me. Perhaps that is one of the many reasons why I have especially admired four men who achieved fame as football players. All played 60-minute games. Two were linemen and two played in the backfield. And two played against each other. All four served with distinction in the Navy during World War II. While all were fierce competitors on the gridiron, in social settings they were quiet, quiet-spoken, modest gentlemen who avoided discussion of their exploits on the field or their heroism in combat. Each impressed me with his quiet confidence in his ability to evaluate the talents of his potential adversaries as well as his friends and associates. And they, sh they shared an important virtue, courage. 
The youngest, Norman J. Berry, was my contemporary. Jack was an end on the undefeated Notre Dame team coached by Frank Leahy in 1941. We became friends and associates in a large law firm in 1947, and along with Ed Rothschild, formed our own three-man partnership in 1952. I am sure that Jack's experience in competitive football enhanced his skills as an advocate in our adversary system of justice. It was his superb judgment that made him one of the best, if not the best, trial lawyer at, at our bar when I was practicing law in Chicago. The second was Byron White, an All-American from Colorado, a Rhodes Scholar, and the leading ground gainer for at least one year in the National Football League. I first met Byron in Pearl Harbor during World War II, but did not have the opportunity to get to know him well until after we became colleagues on the Supreme Court. I think two of his many fine qualities are attributable to his experience as an athlete. He never took what he characterized as a, quote, cheap shot, unquote, at, any, <coughs> at anybody, and he was the quintessential team player. Whenever it was necessary for a justice to undertake a burdensome and unpleasant assignment, he was always the first to volunteer. The third, Jay Burwanger, was the first winner of the Heisman Trophy and a fraternity brother and friend, of, and friend and classmate of my older brother, Jim. They graduated from the University of Chicago in 1936. I was then a student at the high school affiliated with the University of Chicago and therefore was eligible to purchase a C book for $5 that included season tickets for all athletic events for an entire year at the university. In the 1930s, Chicago was in the Big Ten Conference, playing its home games in Stagg Field, which later became famous because the research that produced the atomic bomb was conducted in a secret location under the field's west stands. The secrecy of that location had been a university tradition because for reasons that I have never understood, the Senior Men's Honor Society had been conducting clandestine meetings there for many years. <laughs> On October 13, 1934, I was in the stands when the, <coughs> when the Michigan Wolf Wolverines played an exceed exceeding exceptionally memorable, memorable game against the Chicago Maroons. Jay Berwanger and my fourth hero, Gerald Ford, played against each other in that game. During the first quarter, neither team scored. During the first half, Ber Berwanger gained a total of just four yards on 10 carries. When Ford tackled Jay on one of those carries, as Ford later recounted, Jay's, heel, Jay's quote, heel hit my cheekbone and opened it up three inches. The, the injury both left a scar that would accompany Ford for the rest of his life and caused Ford to be taken out of the game. Chicago then went on to win by a score of 27 to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that may have been the greatest victory in the history of the University of Chicago <laughs> football team. I have referred to this history because of its relevance to my first meeting with Gerald Ford in November of 1975. Unfriendly cartoonists like to portray the president in a squashed football helmet, presumably implying that repeated physical contact on the football field had had an adverse impact on his mental acuity. I think he also had stumbled once when getting off Air Force One an incident that the cartoonists used to suggest he was a clumsy guy. My view of the collateral effects of his athletic career, which point in precisely the opposite direction, were overwhelmingly confirmed during our first never-to-be-forgotten meeting. At the suggestion of Attorney General Edward Levy, the President hosted a dinner at the White House for a number of federal judges including several who had been identified in the press as likely successors to Justice Douglas, who had resigned a few days earlier. 
While after dinner coffee was being served, President Ford came to our table, pulled up a chair next to me, and told us about the status of his negotiations concerning a potential federal bailout of New York City. The city, it appeared, was on the br brink of bankruptcy. In a matter of seconds, and this is so true I can't emphasize it enough, I, was found, I found that I was talking to an extremely competent lawyer who also happened to be an extremely nice guy. My principal me memory of that con conversation has nothing to do with the Supreme Court. It is rather about a man who I knew immediately I would like to have as a friend. This afternoon, I'm going to say a few words about President Ford's impact on an important Supreme Court de decision involving the University of Michigan's Affirmative Action Program, and then comment briefly about one exceptionally important decision that he made shortly after becoming president. The source of Ford's interest in fair treatment of minorities dates back to his days as a football star, and the decision to which I'll, I shall refer was unquestionably influenced by his respect for the University of Chicago, which happens to be my alma mater. One of Ford's good friends and teammates on the 1934 squad was Willis Ward, who happened to be an African American. While that fact would have no special significance today, it was then a matter of critical importance to the Georgia Tech team that was scheduled to visit Ann Arbor to play against Michigan that fall. They presented an ultimatum to the university, announcing that they would boycott the game unless they were assured that Ward would not be allowed to play against them. Gerald Ford was so offended by the ultimatum that he told the coach he would not play, a, play against North Carolina unless Michigan, against Georgia, unless Michigan rejected the Georgia demand. Ultimately, however, Ward persuaded him to play because Ward thought it more important to beat Georgia Tech than to cancel the game. I am happy to note that Michigan did win by a score of 9-2, to two, no small achievement in an otherwise victoryless season. I'm sure the incident must have left an indelible impression on Ford. In 2003, which of course was some time after I joined the Supreme Court and after Ford had left the White House, the court upheld the Michigan Law School's Affirmative Action Program in the case known as Grutter against Bollinger. The court's deliberations in the case were in assisted and indeed significantly influenced by an amicus curiae brief filed on behalf of a number of senior military officers by two Washington, D.C. lawyers, Carter Phillips and Virginia Seitz. After my retirement from the court, I wrote to Carter Phillips asking if there was any truth in the rumor that Gerald Ford had played a role in the decision to file that brief. Taking pains to make sure that he did not breach any attorney-client privilege, Carter's response acknowledged not only that Ford was what he called the, quote, but for, unquote, cause of the brief preparation and filing, but also that President Ford had been the first person to suggest that former military officers as a group had a very important message to present to the court. Three aspects of that message merit special comment. Its legal reasoning, its historical context, and the prestige of its authors. As Justice O'Connor acknowledged in her opinion for the court, there was a good deal of language in the court's earlier opinions that had suggested that remedying past discrimination was the only permissible justification for race-based government action. Rather than discussing any need for or any interest in providing a remedy for past sins, the military brief concentrated on describing future benefits that could be obtained from a diverse stu student body. The authors of the brief did not make the historical blunder of relying on a dissenting opinion to support their legal approach but they effectively endorsed the views that I unsuccessfully espoused in an earlier case that involved a black high school teacher in Jackson, Michigan. The court's holding that the law school had a compelling interest in attaining a diverse student body 
emphasizes the future rather than the past. The brief recounted the transition from a segregated to an integrated military. Within a few years after President Truman's 1948 executive order abolishing segregation in the armed forces, the enli enlisted ranks were fully integrated. Yet, during the 1960s and 1970s, they were commanded by an overwhelmingly white officer corps. The chasm between the racial composition of the officer corps and the enlisted personnel undermined military effectiveness in a number of ways set forth in the brief. In time, the leaders of the military recognized the critical link between minority officers and military readiness eventually concluding that, quote, success with the challenge of diversity is critical to national security, unquote. They met that challenge by adopting race-conscious recruiting, preparatory, and admissions policies at the service academies and in ROTC programs. The historical discussion did not merely imply that a ruling that would outlaw the programs would jeopardize national security, but also that an approval of Michigan's programs would provide significant educational benefits for civilian leaders. The identity of the 29 leaders who joined the brief added impressive force to their argument. 14 of them, including men like Wesley Clark and Norman Schwarzkopf, had achieved four-star rank. They were all thoroughly familiar with the dramatic differences between the pre-1948 segregated forces and the modern integrated military. President Ford, who also rendered heroic service during World War II, played the key role in selecting them. Writing for the court, Just Justice Sandra Day O'Connor quoted from and embraced this argument from the brief. Quote, the military cannot achieve an officer corps that is both highly qualified and racially diverse unless the service academies and the ROTC use limited race-conscious rec recruiting and admissions policies. To fulfill its mission, the military must be sel selective in admissions for training and education for the officer corps, and it must train and educate a highly qualified, racially diverse officer corps in a racially diverse ed educational setting. We agree that it, quote, requires only a small step from this analysis to conclude that our country's other most selective institutions must remain both diverse and selective. Effective participation by members of all racial and ethnic groups is this, in the civil life of our nation is essential if the, if the dream of one nation individual indivisible is to be realized. Given the fact that Gerald Ford played a central role in the filing of the military brief, it is certainly reasonable to conclude that he shared the views that the court adopted in that case. Gerald Ford made a decision shortly after he became president, president that I want to highlight before concluding. It is not his decision to pardon Richard Nixon, although that decision was unquestionably both courageous and correct. I need not add my endorsement because history has already done so, so effectively. The decision that I do want to mention has been less widely acclaimed, but sheds a similar light on the quality of Ford's judgment. It was his decision to accept Donald Rumsfeld's recommendation to appoint Edward Levy as his Attorney General. Edward was then the president of the University of Chicago a man well-known and well-respected in the academic community, but one who had no political credentials whatsoever. I think he was asked at his confirmation hearing whether he was a Republic, Republican, and after stumbling with his reply, finally said he didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> the qualifications for the job of Attorney General of the United States should be exclusively legal rather than political. As President William Howard Taft explained when he set about choosing his Attorney General and other cabinet members, the goal should be to get to quote, get the best man, the men with the get the best men, the men with the best qualifications for the place. Of course it's not just men, men anymore as Carl Hills demonstra <laughs> demonstrates. 
appointments based on political considerations, Taft explained, are as much an enemy of a proper and efficient government system of civil service as the bull weevil is of the cotton crop. This was particularly so in the case of the selection of the Attorney General because Taft depended on the Attorney General to help him select federal judges, which Taft described as the most sacred duty I have to perform. Like any other cabinet officer, the Attorney General's tenure is limited by the pleasure of the President. The country will be well served whenever a President uses the criteria that Gerald Ford used when he or she selects the Attorney General in future administrations. Finally, I should close with a quotation from one of my favorite opinions written by Louis Brandeis, Louis Brandeis because it reminds me of my football heroes. Those who won our independence believe that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They valued liberty as both an end and as a means. They believed liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice Stevens. And now if Susan Ford Bales would un unveil the bust of Gerald oh. Ford. This is from both the, the Ford Foundation as well as the community of Grand Rapids. It actually was cast from the, or it, it was made from the, the, the original mold that the cast of the, the Ford statue in the Capitol Rotunda was made from. It, sits on a piece of granite that actually is from the same piece of granite that the, that the statue in the rotunda. Yep. And, and so we would like to present this to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I really cannot adequately express uh, uh, my feelings about this because, as you may have inferred, I think I feel the same way about Gerald Ford as most of you do. Thank you. And that concludes our lunch. Thank you all for coming.